Uh, Rev, I, I guess I start with you here. Um, th there is a, the, the notion, you know, we, we have commented for four years about the, about the blatant and less blatant as kind of xenophobia that was kind of baked in to Trump's immigration policy. The notion that we now look back on this period and say DHS was focused on that and not on this, this thing that has now uh, caused this insurrection in the Capitol and, and poses this enormous threat going forward. It, it is both a tragic and also an irony, I would say. Uh, talk a little bit about that, about the misplaced priorities of the Trump administration in this regard. It is obvious that there were misplaced priorities. But the question then becomes, then, were they doing what they were sworn and hired to do? And that is protect those in the homeland. So if they were not doing their job as homeland security, but following the political agenda based on bias, bigotry, and xenophobia of the president, then they were not operating and serving the public that they were sworn to serve. How do you have right-wing extremists that are all over the internet that are saying every day, all day, in every kind of way, some of the most hateful things, demonstrating weapons, putting out this kinds of things in broad daylight, the president saying after one of the most vicious attacks we've ever seen in, uh, uh, in Virginia, there were uh, good people on both sides, every signal that could have been sent was sent. They were not dog whistles. These were loud sirens. So there had to be some intentional ignoring of what was obvious and seeking for what was an agenda. And I think that we've got to stop making excuses for them. Frank, I think, Lucy, I want to read a little more from that NBC News report um, and, and get you to talk about it here. Um, Capitol riot, the Capitol riot exposed, exposed the flaws of Trump's DHS. It focused on immigration and not extremists, say ex-officials. As more experienced and Senate-confirmed Homeland Security Secretaries like John Kelly and Kirsten Nielsen left the Trump administration and were replaced by acting secretaries, so too were experienced lawyers and law enforcement officials replaced by Trump loyalists with minimal experience. Most have had one important qualification, loyalty to White House advisor Stephen Miller and anti-immigration hawk. Frank, uh, explain it to me. Uh, what, what, how do you think we got to this place where, uh, where, where we, the, we took our eye completely off the ball? Do you think the Rev is right that this is actually a conscious agenda that kind of fed into a set of priorities that kind of coddled and ignored white nationalism? Uh, or do you think there was some other more complex set of factors that led us to that conclusion, but without that level of intent? So first, as the Reverend knows, racism and hate was not unique to the Trump administration. It's been with us as an infection throughout the fabric of our society and our history. However, however, Racism and hate as a strategy, as a policy, came to its ultimate fruition during this administration. And yes, indeed, they fueled their policy and strategy with hate, racism, and appealing to a base they knew that that concept would resonate with. There's no question about it. So let's move on now to the concept of consequences and accountability for those enablers, facilitators, and leaders. And here's where I break with people who say, in order to heal, in order to get better, we somehow need to cover up the infection and hope for the best that it goes away. But that's not, hap that's not what happens with an in insidious infection. You have to treat it aggressively, and that means consequences and accountability in the form of impeachment, banning from future office and prosecution of those who actually enacted the strategy. Rev, you, you have obviously in, in your movements at, at the National Action Network and, and your the various causes you take up on behalf of people who have been victim, particularly African-Americans who have been victim of, of police violence, uh, you've, you've looked at, into a lot of the, the, the ways and, and means, so to speak, of a lot of police departments around the country. So when I read stories that say things like uh, that, that, that the military, that military law enforcement agencies have long known that there has been active duty recruitment by the far right uh, within their ranks and that police departments right now across the country are investigating uh, their own members' involvements in the Capitol riot. I, th I, th I find that unsurprising, uh, g given what we know. To you, it must be like, uh, are you guys, uh, what, what have you guys been doing for these last years? If you didn't realize this was a problem, you are again kind of willfully blind to it. Um, 
it seems like the least surprising thing in the world. It is absolutely uh, the least surprising thing to me and many of us that have been involved in these movements. When, when you look at the fact that you saw policemen, law enforcement people being assaulted in the nation's capital, one uh, a scene where we saw the video of a policeman crushed between a door and those assaulting him. What happened to the people in law enforcement that were screaming at us that were raising the voice of police reform, saying blue lives matter? Uh, yeah, I'm at Nash Action Network now where Senator Schumer and others spoke here today. And I said maybe we need to have a Blue Lives Matter rally for them that were abused on the Capitol steps. Because had the people in law enforcement done their jobs and went after groups that were criminal, whether they agreed with their politics or not, we may not have had the situation we had. They felt they had a license to do what they did. They felt it from the very top. Let's remember, if anybody in the Black Lives Matter movement, civil rights movement, any of us, had made a speech, called for a march, and that march resulted in violence against the property of the United States, we would have been arrested and indicted. Right. Well, the keynote right. speaker at the rally that sent them off was the president of the United States. That's why they felt they were operating with total immunity. And that is where we say this was an attempted coup led by the sitting head of state. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. You should know that you can follow today's top stories and breaking news and catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.